such an honor to uh, be here today at the Festival of Faith to celebrate, as we celebrate Earth Day in the most compassionate city in America, Louisville. Uh, people ask me a lot what, what I do for a living, and first and foremost, I'm a farmer. I'm a conservationist. For those of you that farm or grow plants or, or anything, you know that it is a type of, of spiritual uh, endeavor to, to grow things, to plant seeds, to watch them grow, to take care of the soil, to be a part of the environment. And that's something that uh, I'm very passionate about. I have a degree in agriculture at, from Western Kentucky University. And uh, my whole life, that was my uh, goal to always be a farmer. And I, and I truly love that. Uh, also have had a career in public service where I was a state representative in the Kentucky General Assembly. My main issue there was, was of course, agriculture. I uh, represent a very rural district in South Central Kentucky uh, in, the, in the Kentucky legislature. Then in 2011, I was commissioner of agriculture and I've seen a lot of people in the crowd that I know were very helpful in, in uh, allowing me to have that opportunity and I appreciate it. Uh, when we were commissioner of agriculture, worked very closely with Mayor Fisher and Congressman Yarmouth to, um, to make industrial hemp a reality. And those of you that keep up with politics and study politics, it's a very frustrating thing to watch because politics is so partisan anymore. But the, the amazing thing about the industrial hemp issue, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, is it, it truly uh, brought both ends of the spectrum together because uh, people on the left supported it because it was sustainable. You know, if you're into uh, improving the environment and, and sustainability, industrial hemp can replace a lot of the traditional crops that uh, require too much pesticide and too much fertilizer. And, and uh, you can do things with industrial hemp from a medical and, and uh, uh, standpoint that, that's much better than chemicals and, and many of the, the types of pharmaceuticals that we have today. So uh, it was an issue with the right, the very hard, the extreme right, because it was this was an example of government standing in the way of letting the private sector grow. So uh, we worked together in a bipartisan way and made that a reality. And in Kentucky, that we were the first state to make industrial hemp legal. And four years later, we're the leading industrial hemp state in the nation. And one of the big questions that, that people had, well, this, is this economically viable? And, and Yes, it's economically viable, and we have more companies that are, that are interested in uh, growing industrial hemp in a sustainable manner every day, and I'm very excited about that. And last year, I was uh, very blessed to get elected to the United States Congress. And when you go to Congress, they, they ask your committee's requests, and I was probably the only one that ever wrote down their first committee request to be agriculture. Uh, so they're, oh, okay, well, if that's what you want, well, it's going to be hard. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be real hard to get on the agriculture committee. But there were 54 freshmen. There are 54 freshmen members of Congress, 27 Republicans and 27 Democrats. Of the 54, I'm the only farmer in the freshman class, and I'm proud of that because I really believe that uh, there, there are opportunities and there are things that have to be done uh, to improve agriculture. And, and we can grow our agriculture economy and we can do it in a sustainable manner. When you get to Congress, there are endless supply of caucuses. I'm sure Congressman Yarmouth uh, could, has, has probably talked about that in Louisville over the years. There, there's caucus for every country in the world. There's a caucus for every issue in the world. The first caucus that I joined was the organic caucus because there's such a, we're not meeting the demands of the uh, organically grown uh, fruits, vegetables, proteins. And there are things that we have to do as, as a nation to encourage that and to foster that. So that's something that's, that's gonna be very important to me as a, as a member of Congress to try to uh, obviously focus on agriculture, focus on family farmers, but also focus on sustainability and, and to try to grow uh, the amount of organically produced foods that we currently have in, in the United States. Another issue that 
It was very important to me, it was mentioned in the introduction, I got to work with the Kentucky Proud program when I was Commissioner of Agriculture, and that's a great, great program that, that makes people aware of this is locally grown food, and that's been a huge initiative, a successful initiative of, of Mayor Fisher here in, uh, in Louisville. But we've tried to even be more specific in, in that. We've had the Homegrown by Heroes initiative, which uh, made consumers realize not only is this a Kentucky Proud product, it's a Kentucky Proud product produced by a military veteran. Because we have a lot of disabled military veterans, unfortunately, that, that uh, are coming back to the United States and the unemployment rate for our military veterans is even higher than it is for any other uh, profession. And that's, that's awful. And as I said initially, and those of you that have ever produced food know that it is spiritual and it is a type of therapy and it is a, a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous occupation for our veterans, many of whom have returned injured or, or traumatized. So that's something that was very important. We also had an Appalachia Proud initiative. The economy in Eastern Kentucky is, is so bad. And the Appalachia Proud branding initiative targeted and made consumers realize this is a Kentucky Proud product produced in the mountains. Because so many people from Eastern Kentucky have ended up in Lexington and Louisville for economic opportunities to get a good job and to, to, to raise their family. But they identify with Eastern Kentucky and their heart's there and they want to support that. So that was another initiative that we had that, that hopefully made a difference. But I look forward to working with, uh, with everyone in the sustainability community to try to uh, make people aware of how we can produce food in a, an eco-friendly manner and how we can be more sustainable as a nation, whether it be energy policy, whether it be agriculture policy. And I believe that it can be done and it can be done in a bipartisan way. And that's a goal that I have. But I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, you have three speakers much more credible than I, and I'm looking very forward to listening to them and, and answering any questions. Thank you. Hi everyone. We're just coming off of our strawberry high from the <laughs> Strawberry Jam Festival, our fifth annual, which kicked off our 2016 growing season last night in the Shawnee neighborhood in a celebration of Kentucky raised strawberries and West Louisville talent and community. So, and then I woke up this morning and I came here and I heard uh, Rabbi Lawrence Kushner <laughs> speak. He blew my mind. Uh, he, he talked a lot about our relationship to the divine, and the way he described it is um, very different than we normally describe our relationship with a big circle being the divine and a little circle inside it, hollow, thus proving his point that we are inside the divine and the divine is inside of us. We are all divine and part of the divine, and I take this to mean that everyone, everywhere, all this around us is all divine, and therefore everyone in my adopted and beloved home of Louisville are all one. And therefore, it's against my personal values and Jewish tradition and values that our policies, laws, and institutions in regards to fresh food access do not advance equality. And as far as what I understand from my very bright anthropologist friends, Humans evolved to eat mostly plants, and we also need air and water. These are all basic needs. So shouldn't they be rights? Shouldn't access to fresh food be a basic human right? Well, I'm sorry to report that there's no law, no policies guaranteeing this, not on a federal, state, or local level. I've never heard any place in the country or any leader stand up and clearly state that this is a right and a clear path to a rightful conclusion. So, on the other hand, uh, we are very blessed in Kentucky to have more farms per capita than any other state besides Iowa in the country and a lot of rain. And this blessing, therefore, is a great opportunity to bring together farmers and people who are very much excited to organize together 
regardless of facing their struggles with fresh food insecurity and create fresh stock markets with new roots. And that's exactly what we've done. And we've um, worked as an umbrella organization for the 13 fresh stock markets that are about to pop up this growing season. And that's the, the biggest fruit of our labor are the fresh stock markets. They pop up at churches, community centers, and now housing authorities in fresh food insecure neighborhoods. But it's very different than a conventional farmer's market. The food has been paid for in advance so that farmers don't face the same degree of risk they do with the standard farmer's market. And families pay in on a sliding scale, pooling their food stamps and cash in order to qualify for wholesale prices from local farmers, each receiving a share of 10 varieties of delicious Kentucky food biweekly. So Rabbi also spoke this morning about that flash that one gets when you know that this is all the divine. And I think I understand that when I see my 16-year-old daughter eat her Kentucky raised spinach. I see her laughter. I hear her. I see her talents. But I also feel it at the Fresh Stop Markets. And there's something very holy about local farm fresh food making its way from the hands of our farmers into a neighborhood and neighborhoods where high retail prices and limited individual family resources have prevented this from happening in the past and is happening now all at the will of the community with very limited resources. And knowing that we have farmers that you're going to hear from tonight, like Bree from Rootbound Farms, that will build food justice into their business plan. Um, and sell food to families who otherwise couldn't afford to purchase fresh, local, organic food, that there are people traveling from all over the county now to come into a neighborhood they may never have been to before to pay the higher end of the sliding scale in a city that has been highly segregated for one, maybe two generations. And yes, all this is extremely divine. Thank you. My beloved grandmother, born in 1920, escaped Mississippi in 1935 to arrive in St. Louis, Missouri with the boy she fell in love with cleaning houses in Mississippi. My beloved grandmother died at the age of 92. And just before she died, on December the 26th, it was the December the 25th, Christmas Day, that she said, baby, I don't have enough money to give you a gift. I said, that's fine. She said, but I do want to tell you something. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, God never expected you to achieve perfection. I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I went back to my hotel room when I was visiting St. Louis. And that next morning, I got the call, your grandmother has transitioned to glory. My last words, God never expected you to achieve perfection. My sacred journey begins in the space of being raised in a traditional African-American Baptist church where God was a man. God was a man. God was evil more times than not. God did achieve you to arrive at perfection. And there was a doctrinal reality that imposed all of human life. But I also remember the first time I asked a question. Sunday school, eight years old, talking about the creation story. And I raised my hand very slowly. <laughs> Only child. My mother taught me, it's OK to ask questions, baby. And I said, well, I just have a question. <laughs> my question is, who said so? <laughs> And my Sunday school teacher looked at me and she said, what do you mean who says so? The Bible said so. And I said, well, who wrote it? And she said, well, what do you mean who wrote it? I said, who wrote it? She said, well, ask your mother. 
So I asked my mother, who wrote it? And she said, baby, I don't want to begin that conversation with you, but you'll discover it after a while. Fast forward, I went to Harvard Divinity School, and I began to ask the same question, who wrote it? And what I discovered was that our narratives about religion and God have so been influenced by our social position that many times we are afraid to ask that question. Who wrote it? Who said so? Who made this the hard line capital T truth? Fast forward, I serve a Baptist church today. And I feel like it is my responsibility to be the voice in the midst of a tradition that has lived on the sense of take it as I give it to you. And what I tell our parishioners and what I tell everybody I encounter is take it as I give it to you and then deconstruct it. <laughs> Challenge what you receive, break it apart, ask questions, say it's not true. Because maybe it's not true to you. Maybe it doesn't sit well with you, and that's okay. And when they say, well, why is it okay if I disagree with you as my pastor? I say, because God never expected for you to achieve perfection. In that sense, my journey has allowed me to arrive at a point where I believe one thing to be true about God is if God is really God, God is big enough to take my uncomfortability. If God is really God, God should be big and bad enough to handle my questions. If God is really God, then God knows I'm going to say, I just don't buy in. And so as I've began to walk this journey as a young, under 30, African-American male, preaching a very messy and muddy gospel of a man named Christ, I've had to wrestle with a number of realities that start from my own social position and bring me to today. Let me help you. African-American male, raised with two parents in my household, both graduate degree professionals, an uncle that has been identified as a same sex loving man all of his life, now 52 years of age, growing up with that social reality, 14 aunts and uncles on my father's side, five aunts and uncles on my mother's side, a grandmother who cleaned houses for about $35 a week, escaped the pains of Mississippi, a third grade education and a Bible that told her that God loved her anyway. And I've had to use that social position to now inform and influence how I'm going to preach this thing called the gospel. How am I going to tell people that God loves them when the reality is their life doesn't always look and feel like it? How do I tell you that God expects for you to thrive when you can't even afford a McDonald's meal today? How can I tell you that God is on your side and God's gonna work it out in glory when he's not working it out today? Here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that life is not always about arriving, not just at perfection, but life is not always about arriving at prosperity. But life is about arriving at a space of accepting whatever the divine feels you have the strength to endure. And what I've learned how to tell our parishioners is I can't tell you that you will stop being poor. I can't promise you that God's going to work it out after a while. I can't even promise you that you have a mansion reserved for you in glory. But what I can tell you is that if you wake up every day and you are able to bear the burden that God gave you every day, then you have a strength and a tenacity that God also gave you to bear your burden. When I think about my beloved grandmother who cleaned houses, 
and yet served God without wavering. I have to believe that God gave her the ability to know, Alma, you won't be rich. You'll never live in more than your two-bedroom house that you have. You'll never have more than that old 1950 Cadillac that sometimes runs and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> you will continue to eat those peanut butter sandwiches and put whatever you can find in the refrigerator on them to make them whole. But in spite of all of that reality, Alma know that I gave you a strength to endure this life that other people wouldn't be able to endure. And so what I've discovered is that when God gives us burdens, he gives us burdens according to the proportion of our strength. And the reality is that some of us have a greater tenacity for struggle. And because of that tenacity that God gave us to embear our struggles, I believe that that is prosperity. Prosperity is when you come to the realization that your life is what it is because it has been gifted to you by the divine. And even if other people look at your life and say, my God, I never want to be that way. The beauty is they probably couldn't handle it if they had it. But the rejoicing point is that you can handle it because I believe like the old black gospel tradition taught me growing up, that if what comes to you does not take you out, it only came to you because God used it to make you stronger. And so I continue to negotiate this life as a black preacher of a gospel that I've questioned, I've challenged, I've deconstructed, but I've also presented back to the people because God never expected for me to achieve perfection. But I do believe that God expected for me to bear this cross of challenging the thing that I love the most. Just like James Baldwin said, the reason I can be a critic is because I have unwavering love in my heart for the institution that I critique. And so I critique the church. I critique black theology. I critique whiteness. I critique America. I critique God because I love him the most. And so my journey started with a woman who told me that God didn't expect for me to achieve perfection. And my journey continues in this space of knowing that I'm never expected to arrive at any conclusive answers about life but I am expected to continue to ask the questions. And whatever I answer I have today is the answer I have today. And if I wake up tomorrow, my mind changes, then my mind just changes. Because God is only God if God can allow for me to be uncomfortable. And that's my sacred journey. <laughs> trying to put the spiritual journey idea in the context of what I've heard over the last couple of days. And what I've been hearing is about the importance of contemplation and of meditation, of finding time for oneself to think and pray and reflect. My journey as a child began watching my daddy on his knees doing his rosary every night and saying his prayers every night. Mummy also was on her knees but I don't know, somehow the image of daddy on his knees was really quite powerful and obviously still is at 68, I'm telling you about it. Um, I was, um, after my grandfather, uh, my grandmother died, I was sent um, up the road a bit, a couple, an hour or so to Frederick to live with my um, grandmother 
uh, who had just lost her dear husband, who was a country doctor, but a country farmer. And he had a, they had a 100-acre farm, which actually um, not only fed their family as my mother and her five siblings were growing up, but then continued on to feed the, uh, the six children and their families. So as a child, um, I, well, I lived there, as I, as I said, I lived there for three years with my grandmother, but I also experienced the butchering, which was the community coming together where everybody was sharing in every kind of possible way. Um, and then I experienced daily the sharing of the food that my grandparents did with our family uh, and my cousins and aunts and uncles. So um, we lived in a little village um, called Laytonsville, which now I went through after my husband died. I did kind of a, somebody told me I did psychotherapy on myself. I don't know what, it, I, I, I went on a, a journey to kind of go back to my childhood and sort of revisit who I was. And um, before uh, Alzie and I married, and I went into this little town that I had so loved and I hadn't been there for years. And it was, it was like a ghost town. And when, when I lived there as a little girl, um, it still had its sidewalks, but it had these vibrant sidewalks. It had two country stores. It had maybe three churches. It had a funeral home. It had a mechanic at a fire station. And um, I had uh, my horse, which I think does relate to what we're all talking about here, which is, again, contemplation and finding time for oneself. My horse's name was Grey Ghost, and Grey Ghost and I were best of friends. And uh, in fact, I was blessed enough, and I obviously came from a blessed background, um, where when I went to live with my grandmother, my horse came with me. Um, that's probably why it worked. But um, <laughs> at any rate, I, um, I would go off on rides, and I'd ride for hours. And I reflect back now, and I watch my children raising their glorious children, my nine grandchildren, and I, and I see great cultural differences because my parents didn't think twice about me getting on Grey Ghost and riding all day uh, from Montgomery County to Howard County, back to Montgomery County, through dirt roads across, uh, just for miles and miles. I, I'm now convinced that that was what has given me the um, time of reflection, which allowed, it was my meditation. And it was my connection with nature. And uh, so it's why I think I'm so passionate, as our speakers are and as you all are, with figuring out how to care for nature now, since we just are doing such destructive things. Quickly fast forward, when Archbishop Kelly asked me to revitalize the Cathedral of the Assumption, I, um, we studied the history of the cathedral. So I implore all of you to study your family's history if you haven't already, study your community's history, because in doing that work, what we found is that there was real interest in each other in this community as it was forming. As it was forming, when it was beginning, when it was beginning to be the real gateway to the West, people were working together in kinds of ways that now, frankly, we're not, that we need to. And so um, what we learned in all of that uh, made me reflect um, that also there, and I, I beg to, I'm, I'm so happy the Vatican is here because I've, I have to say you've inspired me, the, Va the big Vatican and obviously all of you in it, but have inspired me a lot in the thinking that there were a lot of great, there are, knowing rather, that there are a lot of really incredible highbrow theologians and thinkers who understand that really our faiths have a lot in common. There are probably more commonalities than there are differences, and even they understand that from this little bit of reading that I did many years ago, that, that even they celebrate the differences. But then I thought, I had a two-year um, junior college education. I don't look back and regret one ounce of it, but it wasn't a four-year or eight-year or a PhD. It wasn't any of that. I didn't have that exposure. So that's what made me think, wouldn't it be nice to have a gathering, have opportunities where we could come together, various faiths, and we could learn about each other through our faiths. Because when I didn't, I never even met a Jewish person until I went to college. I all of a sudden had a Jewish roommate, and she was divine. We were best of friends immediately, but I had never met a Jewish person. I certainly never met a Muslim, 
And uh, the list goes on. So I, from my sheltered, sheltered world, and I married, I fell in love with Alzi at 19, moved here at 21. I was still in this very sheltered world, right? I, I, many would say you still are, Christy, and I'm sure that's true. <laughs> but I'm trying, I'm trying to break down those silos. Um, but anyway, what, what, I, what, I, what I, I thought was, gosh, if all those great thinkers know that we belong together, then let's do it ourselves. And so here we are in our 20th year. It's totally extraordinary to me. And it's because, frankly, of all of you that are here, of all of you previously who cared, thought that there was a thread of some hope, of some value in this event. And uh, so I thank you for that. I want to thank my son, who... Um, <laughs> And I know I'm supposed to wrap up because I was told five minutes and I bet it's already longer than that. But the thing that's important about thanking Owsley from my perspective as his loving mother is that I think that the future is, going, is in the hands, as we know, of Owsley and the younger generation. But it is going to be the families that are able to inspire their young to carry forth these cultural heritages and to carry forth and improve on, which is what Owsley has done. Mustafa, I don't know where you are, but your mummy, Gray, has been my partner in crime with this, developing this festival face. And there's another um, uh, mother son that is responsible for this festival. There is another, there are many of you, but there's another one that you've, you've seen up here, which is Sarah Harris. Her daddy is Bishop Reed. And, <laughs> And if it hadn't been, if it hadn't been for Bishop Reed early on, our Episcopal bishop, we wouldn't have our festival like it's true for many, our, our rabbis and our imams. So I want to thank you for that. I think right now we are a tipping point, as Father Michael says so beautifully, and Cardinal John talked about. Cardinal John talked about and I'm, I'm, what I read, I'm not going to try to quote him, but what I read, what I heard him say is that he's proud of his ancestors. And I'm proud of his ancestors, too. And every day I get more proud of his ancestors. And I resent the fact that they were called pagans. <laughs> because they knew that the water, the air, and the soil are sacred. And they are just now, yes, clap. <laughs> And they are now just teaching me and, and with you and teaching you, and let's learn more about their paganism. Let's learn more about why they knew the air, water, and soil are sacred, because we don't know it. And because we don't know it, you know what we're doing? We're killing ourselves. Everybody so far has been pretty mild. I say we have a world health crisis on our hands of, this, of the serious degree unlike we've ever seen before. Now, I'd love those of you who have statisticians at your fingertips to go and use them and just prove that what I'm saying is wrong. Prove that I am an extremist and that I have lost my balance. Um, I'd love to hear that. Really, seriously, because I'd love to go play some golf. I've never played golf. <laughs> but there are a lot of people that like it. And, <laughs> and I might be good. I used to play tennis. I don't know. And, but I'd love you, as my concluding thoughts, first of all, again, to thank you. And again, to thank these distinguished gentlemen that have come from so far to really bring their extraordinary global wisdom to us and to become, hopefully, our long, long-term partners. Because at Louisville, I believe, and they've heard me say it, is an extraordinary point right now as a laboratory. And we will really be a successful laboratory when we actually figure out how to take our harmony um, circle of health and how to really personalize it realizing that each one of those spheres belongs to each of you. Each one of those spheres belongs to the community, and it's only when they're in balance will we be healthy. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I'll tr introduce myself first in my language to start. Yat e shik e doshidene she nanish eje to kachi in the shlono, haska itine e bashish chi, ashi he deshichedo, belagana e dashinale, lila june dashijene, be edil dasin il shagan, aquit ego dene as anishla. I'm of the Dene Nation. We are indigenous to what is now called uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. Uh, but we call it Denetra, Denebakea, the people's land. Um, and I'd like to honor the Shawnee, the Haudenosaunee, and the Cherokee, who called this place home and prayed here for many hundreds of thousands of years uh, before America was even a thought. Um, and I'm just really grateful to be a part of this panel, to, to join in in this diversity. Um, really, really grateful. And, and each of you really inspired me a lot. Um, I'd like to discuss uh, non-dualism perhaps in a slightly different, uh, from, from a slightly different angle. Because in Diné tradition, a lot of things come in twos. We, to say two, you say na ke. Can you guys say that? Na ke. Now you know how to say two in my language. <laughs> nice job. Na ke is not just two, though. It, the word itself is imbued with sacred meaning. Um, you have night and you have day. You have the sun, you have the moon. You have male, you have female. Many things come in twos. Many things also come in fours. Fall, summer, winter, spring, um, infancy, adolescence, parenthood, elderhood, um, the four directions, the four sacred mountains. Many things come in sevens as well. The Pleiades has seven major stars. Um, so we honored creator's numbers. We honored the numbers that we saw around us as, as sacred. And so two, to be two is not uh, seen as a, as a bad thing. Um, in fact, two is, is essential for the creation of life. Um, and I also want to acknowledge here in this moment that today we have more than two genders. We have many uh, people who do not feel they conform to male or female, and they uh, are LGBTQ or transgendered, and I think as we're talking about the divine masculine and divine feminine, we must create a space of honor for those who do not feel they fit into that binary. Um, so I, I just want to mention that too. Um, thank you. Um, and there is this sacredness of two-ness um, at the same time, and I, I'm also a believer in paradox, that we can be many and one at the same time. We can uh, give an academic speech and do hip hop at the same time. <laughs> so prepare yourself for that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and we can have God within us and also be held by God at the same time. Um, so this two-ness is sacred in our traditions. And the Plains people, they have the, the pipe. Hollywood calls it the peace pipe, right? But it's, it's much deeper than that and has a lot of sophisticated wisdom embedded within it. But uh, some tribes call it the Chanupa. And Nupa means two in the Lakota language. Can we say Nupa? And nupa is the joining of the redstone bowl and the wooden stem. And the redstone bowl um, signifies the mother, the, the birther, through which each of us got here, through her. None of us can enter this sacred earth except through the portal of a womb. It's the only way you're getting here. <laughs> And each and every person sitting here, sometimes I like to think about that. It's like, as many people are sitting in this room is as many times as a woman 
screamed in anguish as she gave birth to a human being, you know, and, and, and really held that being for nine months with love. But so anyways, that is the, the stone bowl. And then you have the wooden stem, which represents the father. And so both are, are considered equal. And, and this, this object was given to the people when there was famine and social discord. And so the uh, white buffalo calf woman uh, gave this to the people. And we know that Creator sent a woman to give this to the people for a reason, because at that time, women were not being respected. And she didn't give them food. She didn't give them an economic str strategic plan. She didn't give them <laughs> um, you know, counseling or anything like that. She gave them this understanding that when the, the connection between the mother and the father, the male and the female, was healed, was, was, was held in respect and consent, the people would have peace. The people would have food. She said that even our ecology, our, our web of life that we're a part of, is, is, is founded upon men and, and male and female human beings connecting in a positive manner. And so as we know right now, there's a huge resurgence of the feminine occurring. Everything from the Women's March um, to this conference itself to what is occurring in Palestine that I recently saw when I went there is this um, con confronting patriarchy. Uh, beautiful things are happening. And at the same time, I believe we must also honor the masculine to not overcorrect, to not demonize the masculine. Because at this moment in time, we must understand, we must see through the tricks, that it is not men who have harmed the world. It is a dark force that works through both men and women. And that this dark force is what my elders told me, because I've been through a lot of abuse, a lot of physical abuse, um, and both men and women have done this to my body. I used to be a drug addict, so that's a whole other story. But um, in that state, I got hurt a lot. And the, the ancestors and the angels sent me a message. They said, Lila June, it is not men who has hurt you. It is the dark. And so to honor both the feminine and the masculine in this time, and to see them both as two um, crucial parts of a whole, and to see them as equal, and to see them as beautiful, I think that is the healing that is being requested of us in this time, to see each other as beautiful, to see each other as sacred, and to honor the fact that our, our brothers, our uh, male-centered folks, they are, uh, like I said, pigeonholed in a world where they're not allowed to feel. They're not allowed to, to express emotion. And my elders tell me that it's actually men who are the emotional ones, not women. And so the, the being, the, the half of society that is the most emotional is given the least amount of space to feel, to process. And so my, my little message I have today, because I don't have much time, is that we need to, um, to give men folks a place to feel. And we need to give women folks a place to be safe and recognize that it is not either of us that is the demon, but it is the darkness, the puppet master above that plays off of both feminine and masculine fear that is to blame for the situation that we see. So that coming together, that, that unification of, of each other and recognizing one another as sacred, as beautiful, as kind, as generous, that will generate the true healing that we need. Um, so with that, I wanted to, since we're on the topic of unity, I wanted to uh, do a hip hop piece because I saw there's many youth here. Um, <laughs> actually, I don't have my glasses on, so I think, I think you're youth. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, I was like, I think. Um, and you know, I think hip hop is an important way for us to get these messages across um, and, and to, to, to not only uh, link the masculine and the feminine, but to, to link the generations, to honor uh, and respect the generations that are here. And sometimes we, we like uh, hip hop. So uh, this, this rap is about um, unity 
And I'm actually going to use that microphone. Thank you, sound techs. <laughs> Mic check. OK. We were all given sacred duties to this land. Take care of Mother Earth and she will help you understand that everything we need is in the palm of her hand. No need to drill, mine, conquer, or extract. With faith in the creator, we will blaze a brand new path. When we let go of fear, the greed turns into laughter. Unity of all people, that is what we're after. Cruising down the red road with sweet grass on my dashboard. Used to drug and drink, but now I'm sober, now I'm faster. Sharp as a tacky told me, can't hold me back now. I just want to build a new world for my children with love, prayer, and unity. This nation is rebuilding up from the ash of genocide and division. Red, black, yellow, white as one. That's the vision. Every race participates in this new beginning. Sacred is the masculine and sacred is the feminine. Infinite, indigenous, continuous, deliberate. Nothing can stop the people once they got their intention set. Some people say that the land can be owned. <laughs> Some people say that the land can be owned. But deep in our hearts, we know it isn't so. Because we don't even keep this flesh or this bone. No, we can't take it with us on the soul's journey home. Oh, the only thing we keep is the lessons that we know. So when we wake from the slumber to remember we are one. One beautiful people under one beautiful sun. We must also release all claims to the earth. Because she don't belong to us. We belong to her. Mother Earth was meant to be a place where we could learn. We pray to Chesapa for a blessing on the world. We practice Satyagraha because violence doesn't work. We pray for those who are injured and those who injure. Unconditional prayer for the whole wide world. Sun dance year round. Yeah, we let the sage burn. Because when we pray for the people, we will start to understand what it means to be true woman, what it means to be true man. Cradled in the arms of the sky and the sand, just a strand in the tapestry of the master plan. Because together there is nothing that we can not achieve together there is nothing that we cannot achieve can I hear you say that together there is nothing that we cannot achieve together there is nothing that we cannot achieve together there is nothing that we cannot achieve Achieve, find love, find healing, find unity. Honjon na hasli, honjon na hasli, honjon na hasli, honjon na hasli. Oh, a lot of questions come up. <laughs>